Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you much, so much, Lynn. And again, I've, I've so appreciated, this is our third year doing this, which is wonderful. Uh, there is no sort of YouTube videos uh, generally, and there's no TikToks about applying to independent schools. And so even giving um, sort of more of a day-to-day day -day on how do we get through this process, uh, really, that was something that you that was so unique about Greenvale is that they reached out and said, hey, you're the expert in financial aid. And, and my company looks at about, we really look at about 10 to 12,000 applications a year for uh, assistance for schools all around the country. And uh, and doing that, we see common mistakes or common errors. And we also talk to a lot of parents. And we thought, you know, doing a webinar for parents to really demystify all these, these this process that is sort of oddly specific and unique. Um, and giving you that insight will help you get through this process in a more manageable way. Even if you've completed this form last year or in years past, it's always good to just do a refresher every year just to kind of get back into it. It's something you do once a year. It's like doing your taxes. You do it once a year and it's not something everybody kind of has amnesia about it. And so getting back into it, diving back into the, to the, to the, to the process, that's what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to go, I'm going to take my video off real quick, just because that hopefully that will continue to keep my bandwidth high so I don't get frozen or anything. So I'm going to stop my video, uh, but y'all can still see me. So again, thank you so much for even taking the time out of your day, be it in the, you know, um, you know, if you're watching us live today or you're just watching this as a video later on. Um, I, I have worked at independent schools and with independent schools for about 25 years now. And I'm also a parent of two independent school kids. So I have a third grader and a fifth grader. And so we're going to talk today, you know, really more from the perspective of how to do the fundamentals of this form and things to be aware of, things to note. Uh, but I, as a parent, want you to know, I, prior to working at Mission Enrollment, uh, I worked at the National Association of Independent Schools, and we did tons of research on the outcomes of children that go to independent schools. So if you're in independent school, I'm sure this is no surprise to you, but if you're really just starting to figure out if you wanna uh, uh, have your child go to an independent school, the research just suggests that children come out of this independent education so well prepared for be it the future or going off to college or going on to be entrepreneurs or whatever they go on to be, getting this foundational support at an independent school just act, you know, has shown over the years, many years, NAIS um, has been tracking children's success for since the 60s. And it is just really, you see it as, as an independent school parent. I certainly see it as an independent school parent, the fruits of my uh, efforts here. And so I want to first thank you on behalf of your children. I'm still waiting for my fifth grader to thank me for sacrificing to send them to an independent school. Um, it has not happened yet. So I wanna thank you on behalf of your children. Um, I don't care if you're making $60,000 a year or $600,000 a year. This is a sacrifice that you're making, but it is truly an investment in your children, both short-term and long-term. Um, so again, I, I do thank you for taking the time today to, to really learn this process, get through this process. Uh, there really is nothing more stressful than talking about your children and your finances, right? Um, and those are two very specific things that we deal with as parents. So I want to take us through a couple of things today, um, but my really my goals are very simple for us. The first goal I have is that I want you to walk away with a sense of calmness about this process. Children and finances are two very stressful topics amongst uh, parents and, and guardians. And so making sure we give you a sense of calmness about this process. If you have all the details laid out for you, what do you have to have prepared early on and ready to go? It does make filling out these forms a bit easier and gives you a better sense of the expectations. So calmness is sort of my number one goal. Uh, and in a state of chaos that our world is typically in these days, uh, you know, finding something that you can do with calmness is going to be nice. The second goal I have for you is to walk away with a sense of clarity around this process. It is a confusing process. Um, you know, what is important for me as a parent to share with the school that something has changed in our lives financially? Grandma and grandpa are moving into the house or, you know, uh, so-and-so are getting divorced. What is important for a school to know and what is sort of extra information that's not super relevant? I want to give you that clarity so that you're aware of when it's important to overshare certain things so that we can do a better job as reviewers of these financial aid applications and tuition assistance applications. We can do a better job of understanding what your state of affairs are. And then if I've done my job, then hopefully you walk away with a sense of confidence about this process. Not only just confidence that 
you're going to be able to fill out these forms properly and, and not make a lot of mistakes and, and kind of have any delays, but really about the confidence that this is a good decision for you and your family. Um, it's worth the investment and the sacrifice that you all will be making to, to kind of make this uh, a reality for your children uh, and that this investment really will pay dividends uh, in the short and long term. Okay, so I talk about, uh, I actually spent a, a percentage of my career in higher ed financial aid. So I often think about parents have a sense about tuition assistance and financial aid really from the perspective of the FAFSA, the college financial aid process, which most of us, our parents went through that process. And so we were sort of peripherally involved in that, knowing that parents were applying through the FAFSA uh, and then they would either be given loans or you know different types of grants and things like that. So that's generally our frame of reference. So I wanna just give you sort of what that looks like compared to independent school tuition assistance. What is, it, what is the same and what's a lot different? So kind of out of the gates, what is different is that families um, applying for college financial aid and tuition assistance, the schools are not trying to get down to a very precise number of what you can afford to pay today. Frankly, because you're gonna be taking out, most families are taking out loans and they're taking them out and those are deferred until six months after the child graduates from school. And then they go on to pay over 10 or 12 years. So really this tuition is sort of amortized over quite a long period of time. So knowing exactly what you're paying right now or what your income and expenses are right now is not as critical as it would be um, if you were paying your tuition right away, which in, in the world of the K through 12, you're paying the tuition really in the next six months from now. So it's actually very important that we come up with a fairly precise number that is reasonable and fair for you to be able to do each and every year that you're in an independent school. And so we will ask a lot more questions in a K through 12 application because the children are living at home, there are more expenses that are happening and you might be having sort of annual changes along the way. Um, grandma and grandpa are moving in, we're getting divorced or things are changing. Um, that's stuff that can happen throughout the course of your time at an independent school. And so it's so really important for us to ask more detailed questions. What are your daily, you know, your, your spending habits and things like that so that we can be mirroring along with you along your journey in this process. So you will find that the college financial aid form is a lot simpler, but that's because they're not trying to get to a pretty precise number. So we're not just being more nosy. It really is, there's a reason behind why we're asking all these additional detailed questions. Um, where do you go to learn more? So here's the thing with the, the higher ed, everybody fills out the FAFSA and the profile, which is kind of the standard program. Um, in K through 12, there is a, if you have kids in lower school and kids in upper school, the school actually picks the, the tuition assistance platform that they use to do an assessment. So in this case, Greenville School uses SSS, but there is FACS, there is FAST, there is a company called Clarity. There are other tuition assistance funny, like applications that are out there, there's about six of them. They all do the same thing. They're all aiming at the same goal of coming up with family's capacity to pay. They just get there slightly differently. And the reason a school uses one tuition assistance platform over another is simply, uh, you know, maybe that's what their other colleagues are using. Or if they have a lot of families that go from one lower school to one upper school, and that upper school is using SSS, it makes it easier for those families if the lower school also uses SSS. So what I want you to be aware of is that there, the tuition assistance application that you use could be different depending on the school. So your first task is gonna be this. If you have all your children at Greenville, great, you know you're filling out the SSS application, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about today. But if you have children that are going off to upper school and there might be a different school that's using a different system, I want you to just get a piece of paper, write down the kiddos' names, and then say, okay, here are the schools that they're considering or they're going to, and the financial aid platform or the tuition assistance platform that they're using at that school. And then what are the deadline dates? And what is the timeline on there? So the deadline date by school, which is also not universal. And then what are the documents that are gonna be required? Because not every school uses the same exact same documentation and not every school uses the exact same deadline dates for returning families versus new and things like that. So it is something, it is kind of school specific. And so you'll, you'll go to the school's websites and you'll get that detail. So just do yourself a favor, grab a piece of paper, get the kids' names on, put a little matrix that says, okay, what platforms are we using? Um, and then what are the deadline dates? And you might luck out that all of your schools are using SSS, so you only have to complete SSS. But it might 
B, that you have to fill out SSS and fax or some other system. So you might have to do this, uh, do a, a tuition assistance form more than once. So just be prepared for that. And then for deadline dates, you know, taking one day just to get it all done, you know, one Saturday, get a big cup of coffee, sit down and just get them done might just be an easier thing than trying to kind of do one one weekend and then do another one the other weekend. Because the questions are very similar, it's almost easier just to try to get it through in one sitting. So tuition assistance, financial aid, index tuition, um, what are the terms of it? You know, flexible tuition. The term we use to describe financial, a financial program at an independent school can be different depending on the school. But essentially what we're trying to come to is that the school is gonna be offering a, uh, a grant to a family that cannot afford to pay full price. And every school calls it something different, but essentially that's what you're seeing. So if you go to a school's website and you see that they call it financial aid, and then you go to another school's website and you see that it's called tuition assistance, those are talking about the same concept. They're just using different terms to get there. And so what is universal is that families will be, will be given a grant from the school based on their family's financial need. So what does that mean? That means that the school tuition is X amount of dollars. And then what you can afford to pay is X amount of dollars. There's a gap between what the tuition is and what you can afford to pay. That gap is what is filled with a grant from the school. And so what you can afford to pay could be $10,000 and the tuition is $20,000. You're missing or not capable of covering that additional $10,000. That would come in a form of a grant from the school. It is school specific in that these programs are not federal programs. It's not like you're gonna get a, a loan or something that comes from the federal government to cover that gap. It comes directly from the school. What makes independent schools so amazing and wonderful is that it is independent of federal uh, programs. So it allows schools the flexibility to have different types of learning uh, programs and they can offer different additional um, opportunities that you might not get at the, at the public school level. But being an independent school, it is very much all for one and one for all in that we have to fundraise and do annual fundraising to fill up the financial aid budget to be able to give out money. And so it is something that schools do fundraising for. So the money that's being given out this year for tuition assistance would have been fundraised from previous years or previous families over the many years that the school has been in, in existence. And so when your kids go off into the world and they become these amazing humans and they're doing wonderful things and they're looking to be philanthropic, they often don't think about, oh, I want to give back to where I went to third grade. It's just not generally on the radar of, of a um, of young folks. And so as you kind of are shepherding your families and your parents along, um, as you think about being philanthropic, giving back to the school helps to fill up those coffers and so that they can continue to offer a tuition assistance program for many years to come. But it doesn't mean you have to do that. It is certainly something that is not, it's, and it's not a loan. So it's not like, hey, we're going to give you financial aid now and tuition assistance now. So therefore you got to, at some time in the future, give that money back. I don't want to send the message that that's what we're saying. We're just saying it is not something you're required to pay back. It is truly a grant, but it is fundraised monies. And so we want to make sure we're always perpetuating and keeping that, those coffers full so that other children are able to take advantage of these programs. And they are pretty limited at most schools. Most schools, uh, you know, can give out a limited amount of, of a tuition assistance for, to families. Um, which is, a, you know, that's that's the way this this goes, unfortunately. In the in, in a perfect world, we'd be able to give financial aid and tuition assistance to everybody that um, that we could. Okay, so navigating how to get to to fill in your sheet of paper, right? So the first thing you're going to do is go to the school's website. So if you're looking at Greenvale, you're going to go to the Greenvale website, and you're going to go to the admissions tab. That is universal at independent schools. They all will have an admissions tab typically. And then you're going to see a, a tab within that that either says affording insert school name or um, tuition and tuition assistance information, or in this, in this case, it's tuition and affordability. So when you click on the affordability tab, it's going to give you all of the answers to the questions I want you to fill in. What is the, the platform that the, the school is using? And what are the deadline dates? And then what are the documents that are going to be required of me? And when are those documents going to be, need to be in, submitted, right? So those actually, that's probably an additional layer. What date are the documents required if you don't automatically have those documents available to you? 
And so doing that work early will get you a nice little matrix to say, yep, I'm going to be filling out SSS for these three schools, and I'm going to be filling out um, facts for these two schools. And then you know what you're dealing with. And we have to get everything done by X amount of date. So when you're looking at the school's websites, making sure you're finding out, you know, what is the cost of tuition? What is, what is that? You know, we all know that it's not just tuition. Some schools have uniforms. Some schools will have trips that are required that, you know, the fifth graders go off to camp and it costs $500 or um, the kids need to take this test and that costs $150 or something. Just making sure you're aware of the cost of enrollment, which could be beyond tuition. So when I talk about budgeting in the next slide, um, or the next two slides, will you know, making sure you're baking in those other things that you don't think about. Does the school offer a, um, a lunch on campus, or do you have to make sure you're you're uh, you have bringing in lunch, and uh, is there a fee associated with that? So, do you need to think about busing? Do you need to be thinking about aftercare or you know early drop off care? Is there a, what is the cost associated with that? So when you do your budgets, you're baking in what can I afford for tuition, but then knowing there might be some additional other costs that you need to be aware of. Um, some schools will offer some additional support called supplemental support for things beyond tuition, and they will discount other things for families, but not every school offers that supplemental support. So that's something to kind of pay attention to as well. So the financial aid platform that Greenville is using is SSS, School and Student Services. Um, they've been around for about 50, almost 60 years now. Um, and so you'll want to look at uh, what is the deck documents and the deadline dates. And that's kind of what we're going to be doing here today, talking um, uh, you know, what does the timeline look like? What should I be prepared for? So the first thing you're doing is that matrix, right? Put that piece of paper together, come together and say, all right, here's the forms we need to fill. Here's the documents we need to gather. And here's the deadline dates. Now, Greenville has a rolling enrollment um, concept, which means that as you're ready to apply, you're going to be applying as, um, as needed for tuition assistance. Be on the lookout for emails and notifications from the school that you're uh, in currently enrolled in. If you're enrolled at Greenville, they'll be reaching out to you and say, okay, it's time to apply, get your application in. Um, there is no reason to not do it early or sooner than rather than later. It just makes it easier for the school to get through that process with you and for you. Um, but you wanna make sure you're paying attention to the deadline dates for any other schools that do have specific deadline dates. So pay attention to that. They typically happen um, in the late winter time and early spring for new families. So pay attention to that with all of the schools that you're considering. And usually in late winter is when schools will do their re-enrollment contracts and you'll be able to see what your grant will be for the next year. And then in the spring is when we do the same process for new applicants. As kids are newly admitted to the school, they'll be able to see what they're going to be paying um, during that time. So by late spring, you're going to want to be on the lookout for any additional documents that the school needs to complete your file review. Um, oftentimes, the schools will look at the prior year tax returns to get an estimate on what you're going to be afford to pay, and then they'll ask you to submit your current year taxes in the spring after the tax deadline, potentially, um, just to get a kind of a check and balance on this is what we thought was going to happen, and this is where we're at now. By late spring, most schools will have you starting to pay your tuition payment plan. So if you have, um, you know, you've got, you've got your child in, you're very excited, you're going to get started. And then you start making your payments usually by you know May and June, depending on what the school's uh, timeline is. And then most schools offer a 10 month plan or an eight month plan, um, or you can pay in two installments, just depends on what the school's offering. Uh, so look into what the different types of tuition payment plans are. Some families just, you know, I'm, I'm one of those families, I own a business. And so for me, I have to make sure I have a, um, I, I have cash flow, right? So a lot of businesses struggle with cash flow. And, uh, you know, a 10 month plan for us actually makes it so reasonable for us to be able to pay our kids tuition because we can spread it over some period of time. So if cash flow is something that you struggle with because perhaps you own a business or you're paid sort of infrequently, um, looking at the, the tuition payment plan options can be a great way to manage that process for your family. And it's something you do every year. So, you know, by next fall, it's rinse and repeat and go through that process all over again. So speaking about calmness, I'm going to use myself as the cautionary tale. Um, you know, we have, like I said, we have two kids. We live in California. And um, what I do every summer and early fall is I'll put together a budget for the family uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because once you get into the independent school world, you find that, my gosh, what did I spend my money on previous to having kids? Because I clearly must have wasted it. And you really try to have to figure it out, right? And so when I do my budgets, I take two months of bank statements, and I'll just say, you know, give me my average cost of 
clothing, housing, food, um, utilities, all, insurance, all the things that I'm spending my money on. And I take two months just to get a good average because in my mind, I think I'm spending about $600 a month on groceries. And then all of a sudden the world introduced this amazing thing called Instacart and DoorDash. And I, I assume you guys have that too. And it became this magical thing where I didn't actually have to start going grocery shopping anymore. And I can tell you now that the pandemic has sort of wound down a bit, I still don't want to go to the grocery store. And But it's more expensive buying groceries through these services. And so I really had to reassess what I was spending or what I thought I was spending on groceries. And then with the com, you know, kind of the impact of inflation, groceries are costing more. And so doing that assessment every, every year just gives you a nice new reset. The other thing is that I have a fifth grader that will ask me in my, my moments of weakness, mom, can I just do a, um, you know, discovery plus for the seven free, you know, free day, seven trial thing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Just remember to cancel it after the seven days. Well, eight months later go by and I forget that I haven't canceled the, you know, seven day free trial. And I've been paying $10 a month for a thing that I didn't know we had. And then I look at my budgets and because it sort of lives under the radar, I'm not paying as deep attention to it. And before you know it, I've got, you know, Discovery Plus, Disney Plus, this plus, that plus. I'm paying for apps for the Nintendo Switch and all this other stuff that I don't even realize is going through, but it does all add up. And so what I do is I will kind of do that assessment and then clear out the queue in some ways and get rid of all this stuff that I know we don't need and kind of get back to a normal benchmark of, okay, this is the money that we want to be spending our money on. Um, and then do a real good assessment of our budget to see what we're at. And I would recommend you do that before you even start filling out these forms, because frankly, a lot of the questions that they're going to be asking you are going to be things like, you know, what are you spending on housing, clothing, food, insurance, all that stuff. If you've just spent the effort doing that budget, you've got all of the answers to the questions that you're going to be asked. You don't want to be estimating because like me, I was off by about 80% because the things that I don't think about is Costco and Target. I never think of my, my spending there as part of like my budget. And it can be sizable. Certainly with Costco, I can't ever get out of that store for under $250. And so thinking about your budgets along the way will help you fill out these forms in a, in a more kind of quick and fat, a quick way instead of having to be like, oh my gosh, now I got to go on this website and figure out my balance for this. And okay, now I got to check this balance. Having that in front of you when you're completing the form is going to make the job easier. So making sure you have your tax documents pulled together is another thing too. Um, typically, schools will require your, your last year's tax returns, which would be your 2021s. And then eventually, they're going to want the 2022s. Obviously, nobody has their 2022 taxes as of this moment. Um, and then also, if you're a business owner, but say you're a carpenter and you don't do your own bookkeeping, um, you might not know what you have for bookkeeping and what's the kind of state of affairs of your business at a more granular level. But we're going to be asking you questions about that. So making sure you reach out to your accountant or your bookkeeper to get copies of your corporate tax returns. If you work for more than one company and you get multiple W-2s, making sure you upload all of your W-2s. We don't just need one. We need all of them. We want to make sure we're giving you credit for the taxes that you're paying for state and federal taxes and any pre-tax items. And so making sure we have all of the W-2s so that they add up to what you're earning in an annual basis, that will save the schools the hassle of having to reach back out to you and say, okay, I got, I got one W-2, but it looks like there should be you know, more than one because it doesn't add up to your total earnings. Um, so make sure you're gathering all your W-2s and all your tax stuff. I would say about 30% of the time, we get families that upload a password protected document. Um, you wanna make sure that your taxes are not password protected. So if you're not the originator of the document, um, or you're not using a self-service like a TurboTax, those would not be password protected PDFs. But if you are using a, an accountant or a third party, they will generally send you password protected tax documents. You wanna make sure that those are not protected because you're gonna have to upload those into a financial aid platform. And then again, plan accordingly if you're gonna have to complete this form more than one time and making sure you have all of the documents you need for all of this, the company, all the schools that you're considering some schools will even ask for paycheck stubs. And so, you know, not everybody will ask for it, but just make sure you're aware of everything that you need before you sit down to do this form. So the second thing is if we've given you a sense of calmness by having everything prepared, everything ready to roll, I wanna give you a sense of clarity or clearness about what actually goes into the calculation and kind of what doesn't and what's relevant to overshare. I always joke, this is a situation where oversharing is fully and, and 
and welcomed. We want to know more about you and about your financial state of affairs, because if you're a new family to the school, they may not know that Grandma Joan lives in the house with you guys, and that's an additional expense that you're experiencing, and you might not have Grandma on the application on your tax return because she just moved in, or maybe you're not even claiming her as a, an actual tax dependent, um, or you're caring for family that are overseas, or whatever your story is. We are only really able to look at, to come up with what your story is, we're looking at tax returns and we're looking at your application. So the more that you can share around your financial story, the better this process will be. Everybody will feel like they're being heard. And so every financial aid platform, any tuition assistance platform falls into these three categories of importance, income, assets, and then family members. So just to give you kind of a, how does the matrix work of how we come up with a family, what can a family afford to pay? Um, Income is being the most important thing, money coming into the house. And then that is either through your, your earnings as a worker, W-2 earnings, or you might have a business. So business earnings minus things that you have no control over, right? You have expenses that everybody has to pay. Everyone has to pay taxes. Everybody has to pay for clothing. Everyone has to pay for housing, uh, food, all of those things. And, and that is something you actually have no choice about. You have to do those things. That's just part of living in, in your world and having children. Whatever's left over from that, you then have choices about what you want to spend your money on. You want to spend your money on more expensive housing, more expensive clothing, buying an additional property, um, you know, buying investments, all these other things that you can spend your money on. One of those things is an independent education. So we're trying to get to what is a fair and reasonable amount of money that a family can contribute, not just one year, but multiple years, many years perhaps, and what's reasonable to bake into their budget um, for them to be able to contribute contribute to non-public education. So it's just one of all the things you're spending your money on. We are not saying that you shouldn't put money in retirement. We are not saying you shouldn't say, put money in savings or put money into 529 plans. We're not saying any of those things. We're saying we want you to be contributing a percentage of those kind of extra things you're putting your money towards, towards your child's education. And we want to kind of meet you in the middle. Under the asset side of the house, what we're looking at is, you know, what are the assets of the family? Do they own a, uh, do they have a primary residence? Do they have rental properties? Do they have money in the bank? Do they have investments? Do they have retirement? Like all of the things that you have. Um, and then we're saying, okay, well, what liabilities do families have? Do they have uh, student loan debt? A lot of parents still have lots, of, like I do, to the end of time, have student loan debt. Do they have student loan debt? Do they have credit card debt? They have other liabilities that they're having to pay that would offset so the, these asset pieces. Now, one thing families ask me all the time is, well, um, are you asking me to take out a home equity loan to say, pay for my kid's education? Absolutely not. We are not recommending you liquidate your retirement and we are not recommending that you take a home equity loan to pay for your child's education. Um, if we did that and we said, okay, well, you've got $100,000 in home equity, therefore you can pay $100,000 towards your child's education. What do we do next year when you've already actioned on all the home equity and there's nothing left? Now you've got an extra loan that you have to pay back and you've not got no equity, now you're going to need a lot more money from the school. And so we don't want to be doing things that are very short-sighted. We are very much about long gaming with families to say, sure, if you've got $100,000 in the bank, can you contribute a percentage of that towards your child's education? Absolutely. But we don't want you liquidating your retirement. We don't want you doing those things um, in one year to then cover your child's education for the next four years. That's just not how things work. Um, so assets are an important question. So between income and assets, if things have changed in your life from last year to this year or from this year to next year, depending on when you're completing the form, you need to let us know because we're using those numbers as the base of coming up with what we think you can afford to pay. So for example, if you have lost earnings by say 50% and we're looking at last year's taxes and what you're saying on the application and if income is wildly gone down, you need to let us know so that we can make an adjustment to the calculation and say, well, we can no longer base it on mom making $100,000 because mom now really makes $50,000. Um, and that was, that's the state of affairs. So letting us know if things have changed or are about to change is going to be really important for us to know. Family members is the other piece of the puzzle. So if you're a family of four and you have two families, so two families, one is a family of four, and then one is a family of six and both making $100,000, what our system is going to suggest they can afford to pay is going to be different because there's going to be more expenses for a household size of six than there would be for a household size of four. And so making sure you're clear with us, 
What is the family members in the household so that we can understand what the expenses are looking like? Uh, we also need to know things like number of children in tuition charging schools. So if you have um, two children in tuition charging schools, you're paying two tuitions. If you have three children in tuition charging schools, you're paying three tuitions. And so we need to know that. So anything from preschool all the way through to undergraduate, letting us know that you have children in tuition charging schools does impact the calculation. And so letting us know that helps us to understand what things are looking like. Now, if you have a child that's just going off to college and you don't know what you're going to be paying quite yet, you, you likely wouldn't know quite yet what they're going to be paying for college. Just do your best to estimate. We understand that you've got kids heading off to college. You're certainly not going to know what that's going to look like absolutely yet. Uh, but giving us a good estimate will be luck. Like that's, that's really all we're needing to know. How many kids are going to be in tuition charging schools? So avoiding the traffic jams, like I said, we look at about you know, 10 to 12,000 applications a year and there are common errors that families make. So I wanna make sure you're aware of them so you can avoid them as you complete these forms and you can kind of navigate very quickly through this process. So the first thing is doing that budget is gonna be super helpful to filling out the form and having those taxes in front of you while you're completing the form is a great guide because there are questions that they're gonna be asking you that you might not know. Like, you know, what did you pay in federal taxes last year? I couldn't for the life of you tell you what that number is if I, unless I looked at my tax returns and I look at taxes every day. So I am certain that many families are not aware of what they paid in federal taxes last year or you know, what did you put into pre-tax deductions last year? There's some complicated questions. However, there is lots of go to line number one on your 1040 to get the answer to put in here. Go to box number one on your W-2 to put the answer here. So having those taxes in front of you is gonna be hugely helpful to get navigating through the, the application questions. If you have changed income substantially year over year from 21 to 22, having a copy of your last paycheck stub will be really helpful to say, okay, I've earned a lot more, I've earned a lot less. It'll help you to get some of the answers to the questions and you can put in estimates, but they'll be good valid estimates. If you have unusual situations, leaving good notes for the school is gonna be hugely helpful. So if you say, well, I had an unusual expense of $10,000 last year and you don't leave any notes for the school, the school is going to say, well, was it $10,000 because you had a, uh, a funeral that you had to pay for? Or is it $10,000 because you went to the Bahamas for three weeks? What is the, what is the detail so that the school can decide, is this something that I can do something about or is it not? Is it something that, well, that was lovely that you had a, a lovely vacation, but that's not some you know kind of outpouring of cash that we need to do anything about. So make sure you leave good notes if things are unusual. Double entry of income for business owners. There are lots of questions related to business owners that are gonna be more complex than your classic W-2 family. And so if you are a business owner, not only is it gonna be useful to have those tax returns pulled together, but even having things like your profit and loss statement or your balance sheet to ask, answer questions on, you know, what is my gross profit? What is my net profit? What were my business assets? What are my business debts? Knowing all that and having that together will help you to fill out these forms because we have families that because they how their business is organized, they actually are giving themselves a W-2. And so they put the number in the W-2 section and then they're asked about their business profit. And sometimes families will duplicate that incorrectly. And so making sure you just pay attention to the questions. If you are a business owner and you've got more than one business or even one business, just know that it's going to take you a little bit longer to complete this form. If you are remarried, um, most of the schools are gonna require that both um, you and your spouse complete the form on your side of the uh, application. And then your ex-spouse, uh, the, the uh, parent B, will complete their form separately. You will, it would not be connected. Um, you will complete them separately and you will not see their information. They will not see your information. But if you are remarried, we do need you to put your spouse on the application because from the previous slide, what we're looking at is income coming into the house by all the participants, the adults in the house, and then money going out of the house as expenses. And so if you're remarried and we only have you listed on the application and your spouse makes you know, half the money, we're gonna say that it puts up a red flag for a school to say, wait a minute, how are they even paying the expenses of the house with this income and the expenses are double that? So letting us know that will help us uh, to avoid having to put the folder on hold and then reach out for more information. The last thing is making sure, you know, what do you think you can afford to pay Everybody pays something towards independent education. Whatever you think you can manage is what you're going to need to make sure and tell the school. Pay, the schools pay, do, they do pay attention to that question about what do you think you can afford to pay 
Um, because if the system says you can afford to pay 10,000 and you say you can afford to pay two, what is the difference? What are we missing here? And so it gives us a good gauge. Are we on the same track? Are we looking at about the same things or are we wildly off from one another? So making sure you pay deep attention to that. Um, because in SSS, what you can afford to pay and what is the tuition is our questions that are next to one another. We have families that will accidentally put in the section what they can afford to pay in the section where they're supposed to put the tuition and vice versa. So just pay attention when you're putting in what you think you can afford to pay. Don't put the full tuition in there. If you could afford the full tuition, then you wouldn't be completing this form. Okay, so frequently asked questions that we get. If you are separated or you are about to separate and you are divorced, we do need you to complete separate forms. Um, it is too complicated to try to get two separate households onto one application when we might have multiple homes, multiple expenses, different parents, different children in these different households. So if you are separated, even if you are not technically or you know legally divorced yet, we want you to complete the form separately. So you will complete your own form and your ex-spouse will complete their form. And then our syst the systems in the back end will pull them together for the child so that we can see that both of these parents are connected to this child. Uh, we already talked about remarried folks that you would have them on your application um, as you are completing the form. Uh, what is the expectation around working parents? What if I'm a stay-at-home parent? So there are the expectation is that both parents work and contribute to a uh, an app to the tuition of their children. However, if a family has chosen to kind of have one parent stay at home, no one's suggesting that you're not allowed to do that. But we will typically add income to that non-working spouse that was not actually earned, but we just put it in as a space holder, and it's usually to the tune of what you know kind of minimum wage would be for that year. There are exceptions to that rule. If you are a stay-at-home parent because you are caring for an elderly parent or a disabled child, that is an exception to that rule, and we would not add income to that non-working spouse because that is the job that you are doing. So you need to let us know if that is the case. If you are, um, if you just had a baby um, and you're staying at home until the baby becomes school age, that is also another exception to the rule of adding income to non-working spouses. The third exception would be if the family, um, if, if, if a parent just lost their job, it's not that you're choosing to be a stay-at-home parent, you are just at the moment out of work, letting us know that so that we know that you are technically right now out of work and we will not add income to that non-working spouse. And you do need to apply every year for this form. Um, so I'm gonna just quickly take you through the SSS application, not all of the pieces, but because it is an online application, it's fairly straightforward, but I want you to be aware of two kind of, two or three different things that I think will make your life a little bit easier as you complete this form. The first is you are now applying for the academic year 23-24. I know that feels like wildly out of touch with what the year is. I know we're only in uh, the calendar year of 2022, but you would be applying for the academic year 23 if you are intending to send your child to an independent school in September, not what we just passed, but in the future in September, that is the academic year 23-24. Now, in SSS, you can still complete a 22-23 academic year application. And I don't want you to do that if you are not at the school right now and applying for financial aid for this current academic year. Um, you, unless you are a mid-year transfer, you are applying for the 23-24 academic year. If you accidentally complete the 22-23 application, SSS can't push it forward. You're gonna have to pay a whole new fee and do the whole thing all over again for academic year 23-24. So we don't want anyone doing a very expensive test run. So make sure you have it selected as academic year 23-24. So applicants versus dependents. So we want to make sure that you're completing this as either or. So your children, we know your children are your dependents um, for the purposes of taxes, but in a financial aid or a tuition assistance application, the applicant is the student applying for an independent school. So you are not both. You are either or. Your child is either a student applicant or a dependent, a non-applicant dependent. So when we ask the question, what children are applying to the independent schools? And you say, okay, Johnny and Susie are applying to Greenvale. Boom, boom, off we go. And if you only still have Johnny and Susie as children, you don't have any additional non-applicant dependents. If only Johnny is applying to an independent school, 
Johnny would be the student applicant and Susie would be the non-applicant dependent. The other non-applicant dependents would be like grandma and grandpa if they actually live in your household and you're providing more than 50% of support. Um, even if they don't live with you, but you're providing that support, you could list them as non-applicant dependents um, if you are providing more than 50% support for those family members. So that can be confusing. All right, so there are six sections to the application in SSS uh, and there's uh, one extra uh, if you have a business. So it breaks out into household information, selecting the schools, income, assets and debts, expenses, and then any additional information. And then if you own a business, there's a different section for that. You can go in and out of the application as you need, but my recommendation is always to try to get this done in one sitting. Um, but there are what we call little speed bumps along the way that say, okay, this next section, we're about to ask, ask you about X, Y, and Z. And if you don't have the information in front of you, you might save an exit and then come back later to complete that. But don't forget, because we have families that think they completed the application only to realize that they forgot to come back in to complete it. So the school selection section, you just basically look up the schools that you're considering. You've already done the work to know which ones are using SSS. If you don't see your school listed in there that they are likely not using SSS this year, um, and you'll have to go back to the school's website to find out what system that they're using. But Greenvale is using SSS if you're applying there. You're gonna put in the school name and off you go. You select it. Are you a currently enrolled student or you're are a student uh, applying for admission for the next year uh, both, uh, by each of your children? On the income section, you wanna look at both your taxable and non-taxable. If you don't know the difference between taxable and non-taxable income, many don't, and why should you? You're not tax attorneys um, or accountants generally. Uh, you just wanna look at the little hover over those blue info bubbles. They're gonna tell you exactly what you need to know. Go to box number one. This is what we're asking for. Go to your 1040 line number one, put the number in here. So if you don't understand what the question is asking, there are info bubbles to help you along the way. And if you still don't understand what the question is, SSS has a call center and they have a chat feature. So you can easily chat them questions along the way. If you get tripped up, don't just guess. Um, if you really are struggling with a question, reach out to them to get the answers to that question. On the assets and liabilities section, you're gonna be asked questions about, you know, how much do you have in the bank? What do you have in retirement? One thing to pay attention to is investments and then retirement. You wanna make sure you parse out if you have investments that are not retirement, that goes in one section. And then investments that are actually your retirement, put those in a different section. Um, read the questions carefully so that you don't mix and match them or you double count them. So they're either or retirement investments or they're kind of regular straight stocks and bonds investments. So just make sure you're reading the questions. There are all these sections that say, do put information about this here don't put information about this here. So there's a lot of do's and don'ts in the little application section. So make sure you read those, take your time in the assets and debt section so that you can get through it. Do that work now to say, okay, what is my balances on my student loans, on my credit cards, any debts that you have, um, so that you have that information in front of you when you're completing the form. If you do own a business, it's gonna take a little bit longer. But like I said, if you do own a business and you're not the person doing the day-to-day -day bookkeeping, we're going to be asking you questions about what are your business assets? What are your liabilities? What are your profits? What are your income, net income? If you don't know that off the top of your head, then getting a copy of your most recent profit and loss statement, if you're using QuickBooks, you can very easily run that report um, or you get a, and getting a balance sheet. So the balance sheet and the profit and loss statement to me, give you everything you need to answer the questions in this application. Um, I would do your 2022s uh, year to date and then um, maybe run one from 2021 to get a gauge of how year over year you're doing, and then maybe putting in some averages. So once you've done all the kind of mechanical things of putting the numbers in places, we know that you're humans, right? And that you're, you know, there's a lot that goes into a household beyond just the numbers that we see on tax returns. And everybody's got a unique situation. And so if you feel like all the questions didn't answer all of the things that you thought would be relevant, here is your opportunity to give the rest of the story. So question number 20 is there for any additional information you think needs to be considered about your financial story. What this isn't a place for is your admissions story. We know that you have wonderful and beautiful and amazing kids that are doing amazing things in this world, or you wouldn't be going through this effort to get them into an independent school or to keep them in an independent school. I cannot tell you how many times I have seen families SSAT scores while that's wonderful, that doesn't change your financial story. That is more of an admissions question. And so 
when you think about what's more relevant to share, we want to have it to really be specific around your financial state of affairs, not around, um, you know, how your child is wonderful, right? That's what you put on your admissions application. So if we get to the question of, uh, is there anything else we've missed here? And you don't think that there's anything else. You feel like your story has been pretty well told. Don't feel obligated to put something there. You don't need to put something there. If you feel like your story has been told, don't feel obligated. It is an optional question. Um, so don't feel like you just got to put a space filler in there. That's not required. You don't get extra points for doing it. So just use it if you need it. But if you don't need it, you don't need to use it. All right. That is all of our kind of things we're going out with. I always call this sort of speed dating for financial aid. Um, but I wanted to make sure I left time at the end for us to answer any questions that you might have along the way. And so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm hopefully putting on the video work still. Yep. And hopefully it wasn't too awful and there was not a lot of lag in there. Okay, was it okay? Did the, did the uh, audio no. go? No, no, you were perfect, incredibly helpful. And it's so funny, you change this up every year. So it's it's wonderful that you know, you take, the takeaways are you know vary from year to year. Um, I think one question we get a lot and I'm sort of jumping ahead and please anyone put in your Q and A's that you have. Um, one of the questions that come up is other contributions, other family contributions. You know, if there are other members of your family that can make contributions towards your child's education. And this is sort of that slippery slope because when I hear from families talk about this is it, it's never a guarantee. There might be one year that grandpa and grandma want to add to the children's educational fund. There might be another year that they don't. It's not something that they can count on. How much or how, how should this be dealt with when people are filling out these, these documents? That's a, that's a great question. I, I have actually struggled with that myself because um, it, what happens is on the reverse, let's take this from the reverse situation, is that if you tell me that grandma and grandpa can contribute $10,000 to your education, your child's education, and that you personally can contribute $10,000 education, so I think that your family has the capacity to pay $20,000. And so if we take your word on that, you said, yep, grandma and grandpa are giving 10, we can pay 10, fabulous. So you can afford to pay 20. So you need another, say $5,000 if the tuition's 25. Great, we give you an award for 20, but for $5,000. Next year, grandma says, ooh, just kidding. This happened a lot in COVID. Grandpa got sick, he's no longer working. They are not able to help us anymore. So we need, now we need another, we need 15,000 instead of the 10 because of the five, because now grandma and grandpa can't contribute anything. Um, it makes it challenging for the schools because they had budgeted that you're probably going to be a family that needs about 5,000. But then all of a sudden, if you need 15, it's like, oh dear, we hadn't really baked that into their budget. So I'm going to tell you my answer from a parent's perspective and then from a school's perspective, because they could be different. Uh, but from a, from a parent's perspective, if grandma and grandpa say, we are a trust and we are committing to your child's education for the next eight to 10 years, that we're going to draw off $5,000 a year for the next eight to 10 years, then I would say, and you feel confident that's going to happen, it would be um, fair and reasonable for you to tell the school so that they know it exists. Because not everybody has access to that. And as we talked about, this is all for one and one for all. If you take that money, that means somebody else might not be able to get that money. I would say that is a very clear indication that you should list it, that you are going to have access to that. If you think it will continue for more than one year or multiple years, then I would list it. And then if it is something that grandma said, well, I'll give you a couple thousand dollars for, for this year, but you are not confident that's going to continue. I would, I don't know that I would put that on there. I would just, I just feel like it sends the wrong message to the school because the school does look at that and use it. I don't think you should be hiding money, certainly, but I would just say, if you think it's going to continue, then I would list it because that's fair. If you don't think it's going to continue, then I think I would not list it. But then if you get the money, then you please use it for your kid's education. And then that's wonderful. Um, I think schools struggle with the fact that what happens more often than not is not really that. It's that families don't say anything about it. And grandma and grandpa are paying the full tuition and fully intend to pay the full tuition. And all of a sudden the, the, the school's like, wait, but 
you know, you're not paying this, but you do have some capacity to pay. So you're sort of taking advantage of a system in that way. So I would say as a moral compass as a parent, if grandma and grandpa are going to be able to continue to process and support you, awesome. You let us know about that and we're going to take it into consideration. If you are not confident that will continue throughout the course of the time, then awesome. If you get a big amount of money from grandma and grandpa that you did not anticipate, I'm going to throw a bold statement out there, but then donate it to the annual fund um, or ask them to donate to the, in fact, that might even be better to say, you know what, we're getting financial aid and what have you, but what would be really helpful is if actually you donated to the annual fund, um, because then that goes to support other families and my, myself included, but other families as well. So that would be, that, that would be sort of my three answers to the same question. No, I think that's, I think that's very fair. And I think that's, it, it's, we struggle on the other side with a lot of that. So one of the questions that came in is, will they ask in-depth questions about credit card debt? Would I need to provide itemized statements or details? No, I, I, you know, there are very, very few schools that would start asking for deep dives into your bank statements and deep dives into your credit card statements. I, again, all of this is a moment in time. And I joke as a parent, right? If you ask me what I have in the bank, on the 15th of the month when my husband gets paid or on the 30th when two tuitions and my mortgage gets taken out, I have a very different answer to that question. And so it is about averages. So if you're averaging $30,000 a year in credit card debt or $10,000 a year in credit card debt, that's kind of what we're looking at. We're not looking at, I have $622 at this bank and, and this and this and this and this. Um, so doing your best estimating. Now, if it's something like you know $80,000, the school might be like, we might need to see what that's about. I mean, did, was there something that was a big, massive situation? You, you're going to want to itemize like kind of roughly. If you say 50,000, they're going to want to know what is this? Is it made up of Wayfair or is it made up of like, you know, MasterCard and Visa and whatever, because you lost your job last year and you had to pay for Cobra, right? I mean, there's other reasons why people have had to use credit cards this year, especially what coming out of COVID. So you will need to kind of roughly itemize in the question but we're not going to be looking for, I certainly don't want, you know, 17 banks, uh, credit card statements. That's way too much information. Yeah, very often, I think of memory serves, it sort of has a, it's an empty space. And you sort of say, it's X amount on this card, it's X yes. amount on this card. Yeah. And, and, and I like your, your point about the averages, because um, I always myself, when I get those questions, where it's like, how much do you have in debt? And also, how much do you have in your, in your current, you know, checking account? I'm like, different Today? day, different amount. <laughs> So using the averages is critical. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I even recommend people doing the budgeting piece first before you even start all these questions, because, you know, it could have been time, you know, some time since you checked on some of this stuff and, you know, things change over time and doing that ahead of schedule, then you're not kind of in this panic, like, oh gosh, now I got to go on to bank rate. I got to go on to this bank account and this. So it kind of gives you a rough understanding of things you're going to want to have some kind of estimated payments on. So another question we often get is, so the award is made and it's not quite enough. Then what? What do you do? It, it, yeah. So you, you asked for 10, you got eight. Uh, do you bridge it? Do you go back to the school? What's your sort of recommendation? Yeah, I, you know what? It, it, that's a big, it depends. But in your mind, if, if this is so unattainable, kind of knowing that you know that family, that the schools have limited budgets, not even every school can even give you what you're eligible for because they just have so many families that need it, that they have to spread it as, as kind of evenly and thinly as they possibly can, knowing people are going to have to gap and, and come up with more. If you truly feel like this is not possible, I, I absolutely cannot make this work and I can't make it work on even on a 10 month payment plan. Um, then you need to reach back out to the school and say, I can't make this work. Uh, you know, perhaps there's something that's changed in your household since you filled out the form, because sometimes you're filling this out two or three months before things change. Um, and they usually have what's called an appeal process. And in the appeal process, that is when you're going to start getting asked for some more detailed questions, because they're going to say, well, we did the math right. So what are we missing? And you might even proactively say, what has changed since the last time I completed this form is X, Y, and Z, um, if something's actually changed. But you really do, I mean, it's not a let's make a deal game. If it's within a couple of thousand dollars, it means that the school probably just can't make, they probably just don't have that much budget to be able to give out more. But if you can't, if you truly cannot make it work, then you have to reach out because what you don't want to have happen is get in arrears and not be able to make the payments. Um, and that's far worse for a school than saying to them up front, I don't know that I can make this work. 
I don't, and it doesn't mean that they're going to say, oh, no problem. What can you make work? I mean, they're going to ask you, but they might still say, listen, you're in an income bracket that you might have a lot of extra expenses, but that's because you're spending at a higher rate than other folks. And that that's sort of a choice that you've made. It might not even be a choice that you can change, right? You may have gotten an extra home that, you know, back in the day was what you had, but the school might not be able to change what you're getting. And then you have to have that gut check to say, can I make this work? And if you can, great. If you can't, then you can't, right? I mean, that's usually the appeal is the only is the option that you go down. Yep, and I, I sort of and I want to encourage that it's it's often have those sort of conversation. It's great to, to you know to have the conversation with the school. I think it's worth yeah. picking up the telephone. It's worth having that that yeah. initial dialogue and see what's available. Absolutely. Um, and then I would sort of say the last question we often get are things I've seen and and you've probably seen with your incredible depth of knowledge is. The discrepancy with these um, the extracurriculars, you know, very often a lot of these forms do ask what you're spending on things like vacations, camp, um, sports clubs. lessons, things yeah. like clubs, things of that nature. Um, and to what degree do you think that can impact somebody's award? Uh, so I'll just like to, from a mathematical standpoint, I will tell you that camps, clubs, and um, vacations are not baked into the calculation of, oh, they spent 10,000, so therefore they have 10,000 less to contribute. Um, so mathematically, it's not really accounted for uh, in a meaningful way. And so when we think about financial aid platforms and, and the calculations that go through, they're not doing your budget, your exact budget. They're doing kind of an average budget of all sorts of families because you might choose to spend more money on you know day camp versus another family that says, no, we just go on, you go to Europe because that becomes our day camp. Like we choose to do things differently and there are different costs and we're not here to judge what you spend your money on, but we want to be fair across the board. So we protect sort of average expenses across the board. And so you, you know, putting that information in there, while it's interesting and noteworthy, it doesn't actually impact the calculation in any meaningful way. Um, so I would, I would nor feel you know, embarrassed or, uh, you know, afraid of what you, because whatever you spend is what you spend. But if you're thinking that by telling us you're spending $10,000 a year on camps and clubs, that somehow reduces your capacity to pay by $10,000, I'm here to tell you it does not. So just know that not everything is taken into consideration because we can't be universal about it. And so there's no way to kind of equally and fairly distribute that um, in a way. So it's there as a question just to get context, but it generally doesn't go into the calculation. Not that that's not a real expense because it is, but that's why we only ask families to contribute a percentage of that discretionary money because the other percentage goes to camps, vacations, retirement, like clubs, savings, all the other things. Um, so it should all fit into that. Right. Fabulous. And right. see any other questions? Looming, you did such an amazing job in, you know, doing, answering it all up front. Or it's, they don't know what they don't know, right? That sometimes <laughs> is the world we live in, right? Until you get into it, your questions might be not there. But I want you all to know a couple things. One, you, whatever system that you have to complete this year, they always have a call center and they are there to serve you. The schools are paying them money to do these forms. And so they have call centers, they, you're paying a fee. So don't feel like you're bothering somebody at SSS. That is their job and you're paying to fill out this form. That is their job to help you fill it out. If you need to go line by line, you go line by line with them. Um, if it's about the form, I'm gonna say to you, don't call the school because what they don't have is the time to do the same because their jobs are split amongst 10,000 different things and your bet, if it's a question that's a school, a specific to the school saying, hey, I can't get parent B to complete the form. What do I do? That's a school phone call or something has changed in my life or something's going on. That's a school phone call. When it's a, I forgot my password question, the school folks can't even help you on that. So calling them is just going to add like a, a delay, but the call center, that's what they're there for. So use your resources there in that, in that way. Um, and I also want to just say, again, as a parent, that has gone through this process and have kids in, in independent schools. It, I just wanna thank you for joining us today or watching this video. This is a commitment that you're making. It is a sacrifice at any income range. It is a sacrifice that you're making, but there is some major fruits of your labor, I promise you. And there is research to back that up. 
Um, but I think you would already see that as you start to consider these independent schools. And I wish you all the absolute best of luck in this process. And, and do reach out to your resources if you get into trouble. But hopefully you'll walk away with calmness, clarity, and confidence. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for hosting this today. You bet. Have a great day, guys. And thanks for everyone for joining us. Bye now.